right, good evening everyone and welcome to this evening's Imagine Austin Speaker Series event, Invest in Your Neighborhood Parks, It's Good for Your Health, with Dr. Deborah Cohen. My name is Sam Tedford and I'm a planner with Imagine Austin, the city's comprehensive plan. And the Imagine Austin Speaker Series at its core is an opportunity to promote and implement the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan through shared dialogue and mutual learning. We accomplish this by inviting targeted thought leaders from around the nation to give talks on various subjects such as land use, mobility, housing, development, sustainability, the natural and built environment, health, education, and social equity to promote and implement visions and policies set forth in Imagine Austin. This speaker series event is hosted by the City of Austin Planning and Zoning Department as well as Austin Parks and Recreation Department and is sponsored by Austin Parks Foundation. Uh, but before we introduce our speaker for the evening, I'd like to turn it over to Lady Ann Wofford from uh, our sponsor, Austin Parks Foundation. Good evening. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of Austin Parks Foundation, I just want to say how proud we are to sponsor tonight's Imagine Austin Speaker Series event uh, featuring Dr. Deborah Cohen. Um, Austin Parks Foundation is deeply committed to activating, improving, and increasing access to our parks, which I don't have to tell any of you are some of the city's best places to go hiking, biking, and to engage in all types of physical activity. So we're thrilled to have uh, Dr. Cohen here tonight, and we're looking forward to learning from you um, about how we can further activate uh, and engage and encourage uh, more active lifestyles and improve our community's health through our fabulous parks. So I also want to thank um, Kim McKnight um, for all the work she did coordinating this and inviting us to be a part of it. Um, and here she is, Kim. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate uh, the terrific turnout. Um, my name is Kim McKnight and I'm with the Parks Department. We have a number of staff here. I won't introduce all of them, but if you could just stand if you work at the Parks Department in Austin and just raise your hand. We have, I know, Deanne and Janessa and Randy. Great, terrific. I also want to recognize our former uh, Parks Board Chair, Linda Guerrera, who's here. If you could just raise your hand. And uh, we also have, um, I know, Council Member Kitchen's Office is represented by Ken Craig. Ken, you're here. Is there any other council aides that I overlooked that are here? Well, I really appreciate you coming. And I just wanted to say we have people here from the Austin Parks Foundation, from the Norwood Foundation, from the Travis County Parks. Um, we have folks here from, I saw Waller Creek in the sign-in, uh, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. So I'm just really thrilled to have such an incredible cross-section of, of people here. So thank you so much. I'm especially excited to introduce this speaker who I've seen speak twice at national conferences and you might have heard her mention on NPR when one of her uh, studies was, was coming out. This is Dr. Deborah Cohen. Um, I think you're really going to be enlightened and interested in what she has to say today. She's a senior natural scientist at the RAND Corporation. She's the author of A Big Fat Crisis, The Hidden Influences Behind the Obesity Epidemic and How We Can End It. Her areas of interest include how structural environment factors, both social and physical, influence health. She's also studied how neighborhood parks influence physical activity and how community characteristics affect health disparities and health. She's currently working on a variety of interventions to promote healthier diets and more physical activity for all populations. She's got, directed numerous projects on sexually transmitted diseases, HIV screening and prevention, and alcohol policy, and serves on technical and advisory panels for the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Cohen received her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, her master's in public health and epidemiology from the UCA, UCLA School of Public Health and has a bachelor's of art in filmmaking from Yale University. She's a board certified in uh, public health and preventative medicine. And she's here to talk about the critical importance of investing in neighborhood parks um, as a way of achieving some incredible uh, health outcomes. So thank you so much for being here. Okay. okay, good evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, you know, as um, Kim said, I'm a physician, and uh, I, my specialty is public health and preventive medicine. So you, there aren't too many people like me that, you know, have medical degrees, but really I devote all my time to research, 
and the research has to do with primary prevention is how you can get people to have a healthy lifestyle so they don't get sick and they don't need to, you know, see the regular family doctor or internist. So physical activity is, of course, uh, one of the most important health behaviors that we can engage in. Uh, people who are active live longer. They have a, a lower incidence of many chronic diseases. And, um, and so why am I uh, here and talking about parks? Because parks are largely the answer. Uh, those are places where people can be active. They're designed to be moderate and vigorously active, which is really what's important for health and fitness. So why don't we go to the first slide? Okay, so as I mentioned, parks are places where people are active. They have all kinds of facilities for activity, walking paths, green space, playgrounds. And uh, we have a huge infrastructure of parks throughout our country. Uh, about 70% um, of people live within two miles of a public park, and in many cities, it's, you know, there are many more parks, like San Francisco, 98% of the people live within a quarter mile of a park. It's one of the most uh, park-dense um, uh, cities. And I know many cities are trying to get there and increase the number of parks, so uh, they're, you know, in walking distance. Okay, next. So, um, so what I want to talk about today is what do we know about um, parks and how they're actually used. And what I concentrate on are neighborhood parks, which are the smaller parks that are, you know, really within walking distance of uh, people's homes. They're usually like three to 20 acres. And uh, so we wanted to study uh, what the conditions were, the characteristics, what are the practices uh, that are related to how people use parks. And uh, what are those things that, you know, make a park more friendly or, you know, are actually barriers to people being active in the park? So let's go to the next. Okay, so in order to answer those questions, one of the most important things we had to do was develop a method to actually measure park use. You know, up until the past uh, you know, uh, 10, 15 years, really nobody has measured park use systematically. You know, most uh, cities, they can maybe count uh, how many people register for programs that they have in the parks, but most people in parks are just there on their own. They are not participating in programs. So I haven't found a single agency yet that has actually physically measured their park use. And um, so what we did is we developed a method where we go to a park and we map it and we divide it into what we call target areas. And uh, once we have target areas, uh, then we rotate through it, and we do it the same way each time. So for example, this is a park you can see there's baseball diamonds, and um, there's um, courts here. And here I started with gym as number one. And um, basically, once we, we, go, we, we make a target area a space that usually has one function, and we design it so that we can actually see the whole space in one sweep of your eyes. And then we count the people in those space and we count them by gender, by age group, are they children, teens, adults, or seniors? We count them by race, ethnicity, and we count them by activity level. Are they sedentary? Are they in moderate activity or vigorous activity? And so uh, we'll rotate through the space and we'll count each person in each space so we know who's there. And we also record what are they doing. We also record some conditions about the spaces. You know, what's happening? Is the activity organized or supervised? Is there loose equipment? Um, is, is the place um, empty? Uh, you know, we'll record all those things. And, um, and we do it several times a day for several days a week. And after all these years of using this method, we figured out it's good enough to measure uh, like three times a day, four days a week, and we can use that information to estimate the use for the entire week. Uh, as long as we include at least one weekend day, because people use it di uh, parks differently on weekdays and weekends. And we also have different hours of the days because they use them differently in the mornings and the afternoons. So we have this method, it's called SOPARC, Systematic, observation of play and recreation in communities. Okay. 
So, um, so we've been doing that for many years, but uh, just a few years ago, we had funding from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to do a national study of neighborhood parks. And so now that we had a good method for counting people, we said, well, let's see, you know, is what we've been finding, we've mainly been focusing on Los Angeles. We wanted to see, well, is that really true? Or what's, what is happening across the country? So what we did is we enumer enumerated <clears throat> all the cities with a population over 100,000, and we took a random sample. We took um, uh, some cities uh, in the 100 to 200,000 range, um, 200,000 to like a million, and then we had a few cities that had over a million population. And we ended up selecting 25 cities uh, in all the regions of the U.S. And then within each city, we enumerated all of their neighborhood parks, you know, that were between three and 20 acres. And then we took a 10% sample of those parks, but we only included parks, again, if they were between three and 20 acres, if they were in the city boundaries and managed by the city, uh, they had to be parks that were open all the time to the public and not shared uh, with a school so that they might not be open part of the day. And they it had to be not something specialized, but you know, a general neighborhood park. Okay. So um, these are the cities we included. Uh, in Texas, we had Dallas and we had Waco uh, were included. Dallas was one of the ones over a million. Uh, Waco was a smaller city. But you can see we had um, all across the country, and then by chance there was a little bit hole in the northwest. So this past year we added Portland and Minneapolis. So what I'm going to tell you is data from our first wave that we did uh, two years ago, and this new wave will have results probably sometime this winter with 27 cities. And what we're doing with this new wave is we'll be able to compare change over time, because we went back to the same parks, and we'll see if uh, any changes are relevant to any changes in the park activity. Okay, next. Okay, so what did we find? What are the facilities that we have? Uh, you know, it was 174 parks that we visited, and we went to each of these parks, you know, 12 times. It was four days, three times a day. We did the same method in all of the parks. We actually went to the parks the same days of the week, the same times of the day, all over the country. Uh, and we did it in the spring and early summer. So what did we find? We found that uh, the most common facilities were lawns. You know, 97% of neighborhood parks had lawns. 89% had play areas, you know, playground equipment. 53% um, had basketball courts. Uh, just under 50% had baseball fields. 43% uh, had picnic areas, 40% bleachers. 35% had other kinds of sports fields, like soccer or multi-purpose fields. Uh, less than a third had tennis courts. Only 29% had walking paths. And 19% had very specially designated seating areas. Okay, next. Uh, and the least common were uh, more of the big ticket items, right? Gyms, only 9% had gymnasia. 7% uh, had exercise areas, 5% had dog parks, 5% had skate parks, and only 2% had fitness zones, you know, the movable fitness equipment. Okay. All right, and then, well, who is in the parks? You know, we counted people, so what did we find? Okay. So, um, go to the next slide. So, what we found that was, you know, not surprising, go, just go to the next one. Okay, you can see there's a huge gender disparity. So, if you count all the park users, 57% are male, only 43% are female. So, men are more likely, males are more likely to be in parks than females. Um, you can see the uh, difference, and it's, it's different by age group. And then the next slide. Okay, and then if you look at the difference in uh, who we see in the park and who's in the population, you can see that children and teens are disproportionately overrepresented in parks. So 38% uh, of the park users are children, but they're only 20% of the population. 13% um, of park users are teenagers, they're only 7% of the population. So that was like 13 to 19, okay? And we estimated age just by looking. So, you know, on the borders of, you know, children and teen, you know, teens and adults, we may be some error, you know. But, but generally, this is based on what people look like. And then adults, 44% uh, of park users are adults, 55% of the population 
And the biggest disparity were seniors. So we estimated there were only 4% of the park users were seniors, but they are 18% of the population. And seniors we defined as people who looked like they were over 60. So again, it's, it's subjective, but it was, it's, it's, you know, people really, you know, estimated this the same, you know, across all the country. Okay. So how active were park users? Um, well, uh, for children and teens, about 50% of them were in moderate to vigorous activity when we saw them, but among adults and seniors, it's less than a third. Um, so, and it makes sense, you know, children and teens are generally more active, more energy, and, uh, you know, adults and seniors um, are more likely to be sedentary in the park, but that's okay, because a lot of people, we, we've done some other studies where we actually had people wear accelerometers and GPS monitors, and so we could see, you know, where they're getting activity, and in fact, people get more activity walking to the park than they do in the park. And that's okay, you know, they, it's good to, it's a destination, it's a place where people go, and once they get there, it's okay to relax. So, uh, but we do see, again, see um, a lot of activity with children and teens, and we know that just being outdoors is a, is a way to get kids to be more active. Next. Okay, so when we look at the facilities that have the most people in moderate to vigorous physical activity, the one that generated the most for all ages is walking paths. They were very important, and again, only 29% of parks had walking paths. Um, I think it was interesting, uh, the only city we went to where every park had a walking path, can you guess which one that was? Waco, Texas. That's one of their uh, must-haves for their neighborhood parks. We were very surprised to hear that. Uh, gyms are second, but again, very few parks have gyms. Pools, you know, anyone in a pool is in at least moderate physical activity. So it's, it's a great way to be uh, active. Um, skate parks, uh, very, people are very active, but it's mostly teenage boys <laughs> young or young adult males. Uh, fitness zones, uh, you know, once you're using the fitness zone equipment, you're at least in moderate, if not vigorous, physical activity. So uh, those, you know, automatically get people more active. Uh, water features, and then outdoor basketball, exercise. Baseball is relatively low. I mean, we have relatively high numbers because a lot of people play baseball, but it's a, a sedentary sport. You know, most of the time you're playing baseball, you're either sitting in the dugout waiting for your team to go out in the field, and then if you're out in the field, you're just waiting for the ball to come to you, right? Or near you. So, um, and then sports fields. But there's a lot of people play baseball in the United States. Okay. All right, so what are the things that we saw that were associated with park use? Well, the first one was size. So larger parks tend to have more users. But, wait, 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 <laughs> okay. So every additional acre of a park was associated with 9% more people in the park. Uh, the second is population density. So it makes sense, if there's a lot more people living around the park, you're gonna see more people in the park. And so every 10,000 additional people within a mile radius of the park meet, uh, results in about 13% more park users. Okay, and the next one, uh, was uh, poverty. So parks in high poverty neighborhoods are used less. And so if a park, uh, so every 10 percent points lower poverty rate is 14 percent more people in the park. Okay? The next one is facilities. So the more things there are to do in the park, you know, a tennis court, a playground, um, a basketball court, a field, the more facilities, the more people. So every four additional facilities, 14% more users. And the, the big ones are having programming. So uh, any additional supervised activity increases the number of people in the park by 48%. And then the next, the big one is marketing. If there are banners and posters and flyers, marketing programs in the park, 62% more users in that park, okay? 
So the, these are the, the main findings with, you know, looking at all of the things we measured in the park. Okay. So um, the other thing uh, I mentioned earlier is, is the importance of these walking loops or walking trails in parks. So we found that parks that had these walking trails had 80% more users compared to parks that did not have walking trails. And, uh, um, and not only that, they attracted more seniors. So if a park without a walking path had 4% of, of the park users were seniors, they were 8% in parks with walking paths. Um, also, the levels of people, the numbers of people engaging in moderate to vigorous physical activity were 90% higher. And it wasn't just because they were walking on the walking path. They were also more active in other areas of the park. So there's something about the walking path, you know, that maybe activates people to be more active, you know, elsewhere. And then um, also parks with walking paths were much less likely to be empty uh, than parks that lacked them. You know, 174 parks, there were a few parks where we went there 12 times, you know, these same four days a week and no one ever came. We did have a few parks like that. But, um, you know, parks, uh, I would say generally everywhere were underutilized. They're especially in the mornings and during the weekdays, they're relatively empty and they're twice uh, as busy, twice as likely to be used in the, on the weekends. You know, it makes sense. You know, people are working during the day, kids are at school, and so who's there to use the parks? It would be, you know, people who are retired or, you know, people with young children who are staying home. Uh, but their parks tend to be busier in the afternoons and on the weekends. Okay. Okay, so what are people doing in the parks? And as I mentioned, there was a gender disparity, but surprisingly, the gender disparity is among young people more than it is among older people. So when you count all the children in the park, only 40% are girls and 60% are boys. So why is it? What are they doing? Well, it turns out that boys are much more likely to be in organized sports. And, you know, parks are, well, we see more children because parks are mainly designed for children. You know, they have playground areas. I mean, they have special features just for children. And since boys play more organized sports and if they have a lot of fields, that's probably why we see a lot more boys in parks. So we don't have enough organized sports or you know, activities that girls are interested in, in our parks right now. So what are girls doing? They're mainly in the playground area, or they're sitting or standing. They could be watching, you know, the boys, or uh, walking, picnic. Only 4% were playing baseball or softball. 4% were playing soccer. But for boys, it's, it's, they're much more involved in sports. So 21% are playing baseball or softball. Only 19% in the playground. And then you get at the bottom 6% playing soccer, 5% basketball. Okay, next slide. Okay, what about teens? So this is even worse. Only 35% of the teens are girls and 65% are boys. Okay, and what are the girls doing? Well, only 4%, you know, are playing sports, baseball or softball. But they're sitting, uh, standing, walking, 10% are in the playground. A lot of them could just be taking care of younger siblings. Um, picnic, swimming. Uh, but boys are really involved in sports. 19% are playing basketball, 11% uh, baseball, 7% soccer, and 6% skateboarding. We hardly see girls in those skateboarding par uh, uh, parks. Okay, next. Okay, what about adults? Well, here we have almost half and half, women and men. Uh, but what are they doing that's different? Well, uh, the women are really not doing a lot of moderate to vigorous physical activity. They are sitting, standing, there's 12% are walking, picnic area, playground activities, they're watching kids, right? Um, other 2% lying down. <laughs> men, uh, sitting is number one also. But 12% are still playing baseball or softball, 10% walking, 8% playing soccer, 7% basketball. So men are actually twice as likely to be in moderate to vigorous physical activity as women are in, in our parks. 
Next. And what about seniors? Here we, we still see more men than women. Uh, women are sitting most of the time, walking also 14%. Picnic, standing, still in the playground watching kids, 4%. But about men, sitting, walking, standing, picnics, still got some people in sports, 3% playing tennis, and 3% playing baseball or softball. Okay, next. So when I mentioned the disparities by socioeconomic status, well, um, what we find is that the parks in the high poverty areas tend to be smaller than parks in wealthier areas. And part of it is just the limited land if they're in more densely populated areas. Uh, but it's only about an acre difference, but we didn't see any difference in the number of facilities. So they, they may be smaller, but they have the same uh, numbers of uh, you know, basketball courts, tennis courts, and so on. They, they have similar facilities. But what, they, what is very different are the number of supervised activities is the amount of programming. They have less than half of the average programming of a park in a wealthier neighborhood. So they had an average of, we, we saw an average of three uh, supervised activities per park compared to 7.3 uh, for parks above the median uh, poverty level for that city. And there was uh, also a little bit more litter. Uh, and part of that might be because um, of a population density and a relative you know, um, use per space. Uh, but um, there was no difference in the number of homeless people or loose dogs or other uh, incivilities in those parks. They're all pretty well maintained. And 97% of all the facilities in all the parks across the country that we visited were usable. So our parks are in really pretty good shape uh, as far as the facilities and the maintenance. The, the real deficit has to do with programming and marketing and outreach. Okay, and um, just getting back to uh, uh, you know what parks can really do. Now this is a, a, a graph that we I did based on uh, parks that I've studied in Los Angeles. Now we've gone to over 80 parks with rec centers in Los Angeles, and um, all those centers have pretty similar um, facilities, but uh, the smaller parks they're just crammed in a smaller area. But let me just show you um, what this is saying. So this x-axis is the size of the park, is the acres. And then this um, y-axis is the amount of uh, hours that people are engaging in moderate to vis uh, vigorous physical activity at the park. And what you can see is a huge variation among, look at all these small parks, you know, about uh, two, three, four acres. You see some parks where there's only like a few hundred hours of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week, but then you have parks the same size that have like 10 times as much physical activity happening in that park. And, uh, and that's explained by those factors, you know, population density, but it's the m number of programs and the amount of outreach and marketing that's done in those parks. So uh, size should not be a barrier for getting people to be active, you know, in parks. And then look at it across this way. I mean, look at this park, Lincoln, over 40 acres. It's seeing as many people in moderate to vigorous physical activity as these little parks, right, of, sm of smaller sizes. So um, again, uh, now you've got this other park, Cheviot Hills, which is very highly used, uh, but it's also well marketed, a lot of programming, a lot of events at that park. So yeah, if you have a larger park, there's ultimately more capacity, but it's not, the size is not a lim necessarily the biggest limiting factor for getting people active. Okay, next. Okay, so as I mentioned, I think it's, you know, I'm focused on the use of the park because I'm interested in people's health and well-being and, you know, parks are nice to look at, but they're really best for people when they can use them and be active in them. So though that's key, key for um, health. And if we want to get people active in parks, we really need to have some measures of performance. You know, we want to know, uh, you know, is this park being used? And if it's not being used, why not? Or how can we get it used? We want people to be active. We want them to spend time outdoors. So um, we found that, you know, as I said earlier, parks are not measuring use, uh, but 
you know, you have to understand they, parks are generally underfunded. They don't have a budget to do it. It's not something that just happens by itself. It takes people going out there, you know, and counting and recording and, you know, creating a database to understand that. And so, uh, you know, it's something we should think about, you know, when you're thinking about how you're going to, if your park is going to be successful, you should have some kind of measure for it. Okay. So um, I just want to go on and talk about some other studies that uh, we've, I've done over the years um, that are relevant for, you know, how you should think about planning um, parks. So, so this, is, this is actually the first study I ever did was to understand uh, whether if you renovate or improve a park, uh, you know, what's the benefit and, you know, what is that measurement, you know, that you, we can see uh, uh, once you've, you know, created a new space or facility in a park. So uh, what we did is uh, we looked at five parks that were getting fundings uh, from Prop K, which was a bond issue in Los Angeles. And um, what, they, uh, what we did is we also found five similar parks that were not going to get improved. So we compared uh, what was the use before the change, and then we went after that uh, facility was built, we went back and measured the use again to see what the change would be. And uh, these were mainly in low-income neighborhoods, and we went to parks that were an average of eight acres. They varied from three to 16 acres. Okay, next. So here was one facility that they tore this one down. It was a rec center, and they uh, replaced it with this new center. I think it's hard to see. The lights are up. But anyway, next one. And this was a, an old covered basketball um, court, and what they did is they added a gym, a, a real a big facility. And then that was one park. And another park, they changed the play area. Um, okay. And next, and they put a whole new surface and new equipment. And the next slide, and then they you know, had this empty area here, and they, go ahead, next one, they put these pavilions in, a new picnic area. And in this park, they took out a, a couple tennis courts, and next slide, and they put a whole new gym uh, in, this, in this park. Okay, and at baseline, uh, we uh, counted, and when we were doing this, we were going to the park, um, I think it was every day, seven days a week, four times a day, we were measuring the park use. And we counted 2,000 people on average uh, in these parks. And then the next slide. But then at follow-up, actually park use dropped. It went down to 1,500 people. So it was like a 25% decrease in park use. We were really surprised, you know, after they improved the facilities, it went down. So let's see the next slide. But then we realized, you know what, the number of activities that were uh, being uh, planned or uh, in the parks went down dramatically. So there were fewer games in the uh, gymnasia, there were fewer games in the basketball courts, and the number of baseball games dropped dramatically. And next. And there was a decrease not just in our intervention parks, but in the comparison parks, too, overall. So in seven of those parks, there was a decrease. Okay. And then we also surveyed people. We asked them, you know, how often do you go to the park? We surveyed uh, residents and park users. And uh, this was at baseline. And then at follow-up, the people also reported that they were going to the park less often. And then we thought, well, you know, what's going on? I mean, yeah, there's uh, lower activities, but is there some issue about safety? And so the next slide, we actually asked them, they reported thinking the parks were safer with these new enhancements. And so next slide. So, so what happened is actually, you know, we started this project in 2003, 2004, and then we finished it, it was 2008, is like when the economy went way down, and the park uh, laid off like 20 to 30 percent of their staff. And so they actually reduced the hours in the gym, they cut their programming, and, um, and we could directly see that 39 percent of that decline was due to just fewer activities. And so, um, you know, they shortened basket baseball season, that's why there were fewer games. They just, you know, did not invest in programming. So they had Money for capital improvements, but less for programming, less for staffing, and the use went down. 
So, you know, when you think about it, you know, if you really want people to use the park and be active, you're better off investing in staffing and programming because that's what's drawing people to the park. So, um, so that was a problem. I think people said, yeah, we had less face time with the public people. The few staff that were there were spending more time with the paperwork and filling out new reports and so on. And um, I think that really explained that dec decrease. Next. So we just have to realize that just improving the physical structures alone and increasing perceptions of safety may not be enough to uh, change physical activity. We need to always think about opportunities for social interactions and, and programming uh, to help uh, park users make use of any improvements. And we also need more attention to outreach. Okay, okay and then I just want to end by talking about some park, uh, total park renovations that uh, were um, taking place in San Francisco. Uh, we worked with the Trust for Public Land and who um, were selecting parks to do a complete renovation. And uh, what we did is we followed these six parks over six years. We measured uh, five of the parks ended up being renovated throughout this time period. We measured them at baseline, like halfway through uh, where a couple of parks were finished. And then after six years where all the parks, uh, all the five of the six parks were finished. Okay, so at this one park, this is Hayes Valley. This was a before picture, and the next one, and this is what it looked like afterwards. Uh, next one, and then this is some of the equipment that they put in. They also had some uh, gardening uh, areas. They had fitness zone gardening, and this is Bodeker Park, and this is in a very uh, dense, uh, high crime area in the Tenderloin in uh, San Francisco, and this was a before picture, and this was after. Okay. And some of they put in fitness zones, and they also had some gardening, and really some unusual uh, designs for the, in the play area. Okay, and so here's just a graph to show you what happened with the use over time. So you can see that uh, all the renovated parks increased their use uh, after renovation. And uh, what's interesting is, like, if you look at Balboa, which was a 25-acre park, and the main improvements there were uh, playgrounds, they put in new playgrounds, they put in a skate park. Um, but if you look at baseline, that 25-acre park, you know, we only counted, whatever, six, seven, 600 people, let's say, and it was about the same as that one-acre park after it was renovated. Amazing, right? Um, so uh, you can see um, Hayes was a very tiny park. It was like almost a pocket park, 0.6 acres. And there they mainly renovated a building. Like uh, you saw the, the, there was a new building. But uh, what happened is like right after the building was complete, you know, we have a big bump in use because of the novelty. But then afterwards the use went down a little bit. Um, Mission, it was just finished at the very end, that kept growing, and then uh, Sunset, the, it was completed in the, at the midpoint, and you can see it went down after that. But these big renovations, a lot of them were accompanied by uh, programming uh, and, and special events, and you know, they all did very well. Okay, next. So uh, just in summary, uh, you know, parks are the answer. I mean, if we want people to be more active, they're going to be active in their leisure time because, you know, our work is mainly sedentary. Transportation, I know we're trying to change it and get it to be more active, but across the country, it's still mainly sedentary. People are still car dependent. There's probably a, a ways to go before more people will be active. But right now, it's, it's leisure time. It's, I think parks are the immediate solution for the problem we have with people not being active enough, not meeting our physical activity guidelines. And uh, we should really be focusing on how do we get more people into our parks and having them used better. Because it's a great asset that we have. It's a community asset. Um, we need to do better for our community. And we should be measuring our park use so we'll know if we have achieved our goals. And uh, we should experiment with different things. You know, try different kinds of programming, different kinds of marketing, outreach. And um, we need to share this, you know, record it, document it, share it, so that we can learn and build upon our successes. Thank you very much.
Oh, I just want to say one more thing is that I, I mentioned at the last, last time I spent you that do you know that we spend $10,000 per capita on health care costs in this country? Do you know how much we spend on parks per capita? Less than one, the less than one percent of that, it's like $94 is the average in the most populous cities. So compare that $10,000 to $94, it's like nothing. We're spending nothing on parks when, you know, if we could spend a little bit more, even, you know, 10, 20 percent more, we could do so much. So thank you. So if you have a question, Kathleen's going to, uh, while well, she's gathering that, I just want to thank you so much for, for your talk. Um, while we're gathering questions, anything strike you as particularly enlightening? I'd like to ask while we're collecting cards. Yes, anyone? Anyone want to share an insight? Colleen? Walking paths. If that's the number one thing to increase activity, it's terrific. Okay, we're, uh, while we're collecting cards, any other insights? I guess my takeaway, having seen her speak again this morning, was the critical importance of marketing. Um, you know, uh, it's important for, I would say that there's a perception that marketing is something that's just sort of nice to do and, and very easy to cut when it comes to our budget, but we have a very small marketing budget given the size of our department and the size of our city. Uh, and so it was interesting to hear the data behind the connection between marketing on site, uh, the programming that we do, and increase in park use. I think we have something like a fifty to $60,000 marketing budget for our department uh, for our over 200 parks and you know, 20 rec centers and whatnot. And so it's very difficult to stretch those dollars to tell people we do all this great work and yet it's difficult to get people in the park <laughs> to enjoy it. So do we have cards that we can? Okay, so I'm going to read some questions and then allow Dr. Cohen to answer. Okay, so what elements would make a park usable? Well, you know, I think the big thing. Unusable. Oh, unusable. Yeah, unusable. Oh, well, if there's nothing there, you know, if it's just a lawn and there's nothing else there, I mean, people aren't going to come. They, there, there has to be something in it for people, it, you know, to make it a destination they want to go to. So parks with more facilities are getting more people there. And if they have something unique and special, uh, that's even better. Um, if you have it in a good location, I think actually location is important. But neighborhood parks are, you know, tend to be where people live. So. Uh, you can't always count on, you know, being like central downtown where everyone has to walk through it, you know, or wants to take their lunch there on their breaks. But um, again, having uh, facilities and programming that people want to go to, it's, it's those demand features that are in a park that'll bring people. And a quick question was if, if the basketball statistics were for indoor or outdoor? Um, the, on that, the, the outdoor. The indoor would be we, it would be under gymnasium. Great. Uh, another question was, what is your opinion on the new child and elderly playgrounds? Well, I think you know the um, the jury is out. I'm sure they're an improvement over uh, what we have now, but uh, I don't think they've been studied or measured in great detail. But it's definitely a great idea. I mean, we children need to be supervised when they go to the playground, and it would be great if parents and grandparents could play at the same time. So I think it's, it's a great trend and we should do more of them and study them. Okay, and this is the last question. Uh, what kind of differences in PR, public relations, do you see between affluent and low-income areas? Who's doing the public relations and how is it funded? Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, um, one of the things we noticed in, that I've noticed in the years I've been doing research with parks, I've done a lot of um, projects where we've had community engagement. It's very hard to get community engagement in low-income communities. Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, busy and stressed out with uh, their lives in a low-income community. It's also less safe to go out in the evenings. 
uh, but in wealthier communities, you've got a lot of people who are engaged with parks that are more involved in you know, running teams and getting people signed up. And, and so um, they're out there you know, with banners and you know, getting the word out. Um, so a lot of it is this you know, grassroots, what the community puts into it. Um, you know, it would be nice to get more and to get special assistance for low-income communities where the social capital is a little bit lower. Okay. Uh, this question asks, what successes have you seen in parks that are heavily focused on through traffic, like the Shoal Creek Green Belt or the New York High Line, where you have the more linear parks? Okay, so we've only studied the neighbor neighborhood parks that, you know, include things like fields and courts and that are not just uh, walking trails or paths. But, uh, you know, there's great uh, equipment. If you want to measure uh, use of trails, they have automatic trail counters. So I, if you're putting in more trails, it would be great to get those trail counters and do some before and after studies, and then you can measure how well they're used. Um, this question, and this is actually something that I am also interested in, which is um, how do we tackle the issue of money being available or approved for capital improvement projects and physical improvements, but not staff, programming, and marketing? Uh, the uh, questioner says that they see this as an issue in other city destinations as well as like for libraries and museums. Yeah, that's a problem because I know a lot of federal funding is, is just earmarked only for capital improvements. So, I mean, it has to be an issue that you have to raise the money locally um, and make a case that that's important. You know, we have some data that supports the importance of staffing and programming. And, you know, I think people will realize, like, that makes sense, right? Who's going to use a baseball field if there's no baseball teams, you know, to play? It's like, we you need to have uh, infrastructure and organizations that get people together and uh, have programs. I mean, it's, it's obvious to see, like, one of the parks the busiest is when there's a festival or an event or a show or something happening, and that costs money. So uh, it's really making the case with the elected officials and having the uh, people who are doing the budgets understand the relative importance of that. To add that we had uh, this presentation given to a lot of city staff this morning, and our big takeaway from that comment was that uh, you know we do a lot of master planning for parks, and we do talk about the cost of staffing uh, grounds maintenance and um, over time sort of maintenance operations. However, we rarely talk about the budgets needed as from a master plan standpoint for programming and activation and for marketing. And so the big takeaway we had as a staff is that we would like to see that going forward with master planning efforts that we start to calculate the needed marketing costs to get the park going as well as um, on just ongoing programming and marketing. So that's something that we don't do. And so we, it's hard to expect people to fund it if we're not actually laying out a cost. And so we, we have a lot more conversations, but that was one of the big aha moments for our staff is that you know, you're not going to get it unless you ask for it, and we need to come up with some way to calculate that. Um, I love this card thing because I think it does keep people concise, but I just wonder if anyone had any thoughts on that as well because I think it's an important part. There's a lot of people here representing parks, so feel free to, to chime in. So, yeah, I also wanted to make the point that we're all being marketed all the time to uh, take up our leisure time. You know, it's like, movies, electronic media, television. I mean, we're always being bombarded to go and spend our free time somewhere, shopping. But who's marketing us to spend time in the park? You know, I mean, that's really good for us and has a, a good health outcome and, you know, fun and so on. But, you know, we get carried away. Like, what, what is it that we do? It has to do with what's most salient and what seems like it has a higher priority. And all of this information and stuff that's coming at us all the time, you know, really distracts us from the things that we really need to do, you know, that's going to be for our health. And unless we're out there competing with the electronic media, with all those other things, we're just never going to get our parks fully utilized and people will never achieve the recommended guidelines. You know, kids are supposed to be in moderate to vigorous physical activity for 60 minutes a day, every day of the week. 
And for adults, it's 150 minutes a week. And that's just not, you know, light activity. That's moderate to vigorous activity. That means, you know, walking briskly, you know, or, or more than that. So it's, you know, being involved in sports or, or walking, hiking, you know, those types of things. And unless we market parks better, I don't think we are going to get our population to be active. That was another great point about when you think about the competition and the marketing budget that businesses have to market other activities. And what was the movie statistic? They, I think they spend something like 40% of their budgets on marketing. So this idea that, you know, that's the competition. Yes. That's great, and I think that was, I think the key to, to this success really is partnerships, and I recognize that there's equity issues and that not every community or area of the city has the capacity, but I'm not sure that, you know, to, to, to really reach out to partners and try to make, create models for programming and make it easy. We, um, after our morning talk, I took Dr. Cohen to several parks. We went to Dove Springs because we've done a big playscape project down there that's, if you haven't been to the Dove Springs playground, it's phenomenal. Uh, we went to the uh, South Austin Senior Activity Center so she could see, you know, which is a very hopping place. Uh, and we also went to Ramsey Park, which is a park that's recently been renovated. And, and so we had, you know, a, it was good to see that sort of wide range. And the Ramsey is, a is one of the really great success stories. We have many of them of the community stepping forward. They had Shakespeare in the park this summer. Um, and so that was something that brought people in. And uh, so those are some of the things that we'd love to continue this conversation with all of our partners about how we can, um, how we can do that. Austin Parks Foundation, our sponsor, is doing a lot of programming in parks, lots of movies in parks. Um, so I see that our partnerships um, are really key through the Austin Parks Foundation, which is really an umbrella organization for all of our nonprofit partners and kind of a vital connection. So I'd love to keep this conversation going. I've got a couple more questions. Uh, what are some of the examples of successful marketing? Are these things like signage or events taking place in the park? Yes, yeah, so the only thing we measured in our study is whether there were banners, posters, and flyers. So on site. I mean, that's, you know, they were in there just measuring, do you see this, do you see that? Uh, so it wasn't, it, it doesn't take that much. You know, if people know that something's going on there, next weekend registration, you know, this weekend, uh, you know, Zumba class, whatever, four o'clock, you know, it, it doesn't take that much. You know, people are looking for things to do, especially free things, you know, in the park, so. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, Lady Anne, but can you talk a little more about the programming that the Austin Parks Foundation does and some of the ways that you market? And um, I don't know if everyone is familiar with all of the, the programming that you do. Does she need the microphone? Can I, can I put you on the spot as our sponsor? Thank you. So I think I'd like to talk um, really specifically, here I'm in the, <laughs> in the light. I'd like to talk really specifically about our fitness in the park programming, um, which we partner closely with PART on, or the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, currently we have yoga in the parks, um, and we also have um, opportunities for Zumba and for um, Piloxing, which if you don't know what that is, it's a combination between Pilates and boxing. Um, and then we also have some boot camps and other kind of organized classes. So that's a newer initiative that we've started in the past year. We're really excited about because what we see is there's a lot of people who, if they're newer to physical activity, um, or if they're newer to parks, they may not just on their own go out to a park and immediately know how to utilize that space. But if they have someone there to lead them through the activity um, and they have someone you know, that can help them, whether they are uh, more sedentary, starting out, or even if they're pretty active, um, we, we try to provide a variety of levels for that activity. Um, we also make sure that we're removing the barriers, the perceived barriers and real ones for participation, um, like bilingual classes um, or providing free childcare which we're excited to do now through our partnership with WeViva in the city. So only one of our programs, yeah. but one uh, that I think is most relevant to this conversation. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for letting us
question? Of course, thank you. Um, so this is a question, why are you focusing only on neighborhood parks? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I mean, the reason is that's where we've gotten our funding for, but uh, we've also studied other things. I just, you know, I only had to limit my presentation. We've also studied uh, the Ciclovia in Los Angeles that's uh, closed down city streets for the bikes to ride, you know, so we've studied that as well. And um, also uh, fitness zones we've looked at, um, but um, we can only talk about so much in one evening. <laughs> yeah. Some really good questions here. Uh, one comment was perhaps much of the youth gender disparity can be just explained by traditional girls' physical activities like dance and the more uh, recent cheer performance trend. Do you think fitness classes help close that gender park usage gap? Well, they might if they were available in neighborhood parks, but right now most neighborhood parks don't offer those programs for girls. So, you know, we just have to think about, uh, there has to be some equity, and uh, if girls aren't gonna play sports, you're not gonna have, te they won't sign up for teams, or you don't have that, uh, then, you know, there should be something al uh, alternative, because they need to be just as active as boys. And this was a follow-up question was, Yeah, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think that's something for you all to try different things and see what works and what attracts them. We heard this morning that girls are, or at lunch we were saying that girls like to do rock climbing. Yeah. Is that right? We actually have a lot of, um, sorry, take the microphone. We were at a lunch today, our rock climbing classes tend to have um, an equal number, if not more girls, um, as well as boys. And so we were sort of having this discussion about what are some of the things that we as part staff can do to get more teenage girls especially out into our parks and being more physically active and rock climbing seems to be one of them. So that's kind of an interesting, uh, uh, so let's tell me a couple more questions. Uh, does Waco's wealth of walking paths and parks translate into greater fitness within the city overall for certain demographics? And there's a similar question that I'm gonna pair, which is about whether or not you have health outcome data. So kind of similar. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we are not able to uh, correlate uh, park use with health directly because we're basically taking snapshots of park use and we haven't followed people up longitudinally. But there is so much data that has followed people longitudinally that we know for sure that being physically active improves your health, you know, makes you live longer, reduces chronic diseases. So we don't have to reinvent that wheel. You know, if we can get people more active, we know they're get, gonna be getting some benefits from it. Okay. Just a couple more questions here. Uh, many neighbors cite safety as a major factor. Does lighting make a difference? Yeah, yeah so there's something, cause there's something called crime prevention through environmental design. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's basically, you know, lighting, making a clear uh, sight, uh, there is some evidence that, you know, that the actual design of places and spaces uh, does reduce crime. And the best way to reduce crime is to get more people in the park. So there's more people, uh, people feel safer, there are more eyes around. Um, I think, you know, that's really the, what we need to shoot for. Uh, and one question, which is what is considered walking distance to a park? Well, uh, typically you're talking about a 10 to 15 minute walk. People are mentioning like a quarter mile. Uh, that's uh, what is being, you know, is, is the goal right now that most uh, organizations are mentioning. And I should mention our city council a couple of years ago passed a resolution calling for uh, there to be green space or a sort of open space within a quarter mile of the inner, inner city. Um, for residents and half mile in the outer core, so that's something that we have been a trying to achieve. And I've got one last question. Um, I've noticed an increase in drop-in dog visitors, evening walkers, so off-leash or on-leash? There was just a question about that. I don't know how that relates to your study. Or okay. Yeah, so we were um, measuring uh, whether dogs were off-leash, and uh, this year we, we also were trying to distinguish between off-leash and uh, like a stray dog, but in most of the parks throughout the country, people let their dogs off leash and let them run around, even though in most of those same parks it was, you know, they were not dog parks, it was actually not legal to do it, but people do it anyway. Um, and uh, I don't know, for some people it's a problem, um, 
you know, it's, it's just really ubiquitous. Uh, I don't know what your rules are here, but I know most places you're not supposed to let your dog off leash. Um, again, I want to thank everyone. I just wanted to, I realized that I'll try to be respectful of our audio, our need for audio and repeat. Are there any other parting comments? The, the way we do question and answer is so that we can capture this in a video, but I realize it doesn't lend itself to much of a discussion um, forum. Are there any other comments or questions and I can repeat them or, or summarize before we end? Yes, ma'am. Here, I actually can, okay, I can't read you. Go ahead. I'm going to repeat the question. So the question had to do with um, models of parks in China that really are uh, achieving success with drawing seniors and, and for social activity, increased activity. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I've heard about them. You have to remember a few things about China. There are so many people there, right? They have a huge population density. Their households are a lot smaller uh, than, uh, you know, the size-wise, you know, uh, so people are more crowded. And so there's more of a push to go out to the parks. I don't know if they all have air conditioning or TV or other things that keep them indoors like we do here. But they also have a, a more of a, a cultural um, tradition of, of you know, doing um, exercise outdoors and exercise in groups. They even have dancing you know, lessons in the middle of the day, you know, uh, people uh, doing in parks. So yeah, there's, they're definitely, uh, parks are much more utilized than they are here, but you have to remember all those other factors that contribute to that. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments before we end? Yes, ma'am, and I'll try to repeat your question. So the question was, how does just your average neighborhood person who's concerned about a park try to message and advocate? What district are you in? I was going to say, darn, if you were in District 5, I'd tell you to go talk to Ken right there. <laughs> oh, great. Roy G., it was just a fantastic park. I think I can help answer that a little bit, and then I'd like to get your thoughts. Um, with, our, with our district system, uh, you know, we have, you've got a council member that you can talk to. Um, the Austin Parks Foundation is one of our strong advocates, and Lady Anne, who's spoken to you today, is somebody who, um, you know, we have, you know, we, we're city staff. It's difficult, you know, we're, we're here to help and facilitate, but it comes time to advocate for specific needs in parks. It can be difficult to, to do that through the city um, in terms of getting additional funding. Um, I really do suggest the nonprofit partners um, coming, uh, coming, going to your council member, talking about what your needs are. We are here at the Parks Department to sort of often try to identify what your goals and help you figure out what it is. Some people have an idea like, we need this. And sometimes if we hear about your goals, we work with the Austin Parks Foundation, we might say, well, here's some things that have worked in other, in other parks. So it's kind of a collaboration. I can't emphasize how closely we work with our nonprofit partners. Um, the, uh, if I could ask you to maybe talk a little bit about your grant program since you're here. I don't, can I call you up just to talk about that as well? Oh, you have. Okay. Well, the Austin Parks Foundation has a terrific grant program, so I'm going to ask Lady Anne to talk about that. Sure, just really quickly. Um, for those of you who may be interested in making improvements to your parks, um, Austin Parks Foundation does have a grants program. It's the ACL Music Festival Grants Program. Um, because of our relationship with the festival, they generously donate to our organization, and then we're able to take those funds and redistribute them into the community to fund community-initiated projects. So we have those at three different levels. Um, very quickly, those are $5,000, which you can apply for at any time throughout the year and get a response within 30 days. There's $50,000 grants, which we accept uh, twice a year, and there's a $100,000 grant opportunity once a year. Um, and this is our first year to do that. We'll be announcing that winner very soon. So if you do have questions or you're interested, we have a monthly grants information session that you're welcome to come to. Um, but if you're thinking about ways that you can build a walking trail or you can install a fitness zone, 
come and talk to us. We would love to support you in that project. That's terrific. And do you have other thoughts about advocacy that you'd like to add? No, I, I, I mean, the fact that you even have a, you know, a channel to do it here is amazing. But if, if you didn't, then I would say, okay, you know, get a group together in your community. You know, you can make your own Friends of the Park uh, group and uh, create your own activities and partner with the Parks Department and say, you know what, we'd like to have a concert here or a dance in the park. Can we, can you help us organize it or do we need a permit to do it? And just go and do it, you know, make your, you know, activate your park, you know, have events, programs there, um, do special things. I mean, why not? It's your park. Colton. Yes, uh, we've got a, uh, Linda Guerrero is our former Parks Board Chair. Do you have a uh, do you comment or question? And I'll try to repeat that for audio. <laughs> Neighborhood associations can be powerful partners in with parks. Great. And that's a good point. A lot of our smaller parks groups kind of sprung out of neighborhood associations or our umbrellas of, um, or have the neighborhood association as an umbrella. Um, but many of uh, the adopt a park program um, is, is a terrific outlet. And, I can, and again, we work so closely. When you have an idea for a park improvement, there's a process by which you can submit your idea. And we'll come out and vet that and have our staff take a look at that uh, for an exercise zone. We do a lot of those. We have all sorts of small to, you know, covers of our basketball courts, um, all sorts of interesting walking trails. These are all things we do. And then we, we suggest different partners. We have the Austin Parks Foundation. I also want to mention the Public Works Department of, of the city has a program called the Neighborhood Park program that can bring significant amounts of money, over $50,000 sometimes, um, to, to projects. So uh, for sure get in touch with us and we can help you connect with your partners, but you can also approach Lady Anne directly and she, can also, she often helps sort of direct and help people navigate the process through our department. So those are some of the ways that you can, you know, do, make some of these amenities that are going to get people more physically active in your park. And I just wanted to end on a final note about the, this series. Uh, this series was conceived as kind of a build-up to our uh, long-range plan effort. So the Parks Department is going to uh, begin uh, the process of a new long-range plan, which is kind of a vision of what our Parks Department, our Park System is going to look like in 10 years, 12 years or so. And so it's a really important tool for us. It's going to help us identify our goals. And so our speaker series over the next year or two is really geared to get people thinking about the possibilities and help us sort of focus our efforts. So if you've signed in, we'll be sure to keep you informed. And I just can't thank you enough. And I really can't thank Dr. Cohen enough for coming. It's really interesting stuff if you're into parks to really see some of the data behind some of the things that we can we think we know or we know anecdotally. You've actually studied it and you can prove it. Um, one thing you said this morning is that, you know, in addition to sort of the takeaways is to really find some ways to measure park use um, as a part of our advocacy efforts to get people to understand uh, the critical importance. And so uh, our partners are going to be key to that. So thank you so much for, for coming today. Thank you.